Hello everyone. This is something that I've never done before. I'm giving a presentation from the Northern Hemisphere and my audience is in the Southern Hemisphere and my presentation is crossing the equator. Um, it's certainly one for the books for me. Um, unfortunately, I, will, I, I really would have preferred to be with you because I've never been to Australia. Um, it's, a, it's a great venue. I've been to prior ISOL events. It's a great topic as well as it's a great set of panelists, my colleagues and my friends and unfortunately a very teaching intensive semester prevented me from flying so I did the next best thing that I could which was to provide a video to share my thoughts with you. Um, so as the introductions must have pointed out I'm from the computer science department and I've been lucky enough to almost overhear these notions of um, bottlenecks and threshold concepts from people who were initially colleagues but then subsequently became my friends and um, with conversations uh, by, through conversations with, with my friends as well as reading the literature, I came to realize that these two ideas, uh, bottlenecks and threshold concepts, are really needed in computer science. Um, but less so for us to be ready for these kinds of problems as students encounter them, but to use them more as a selection process to augment our curriculum with the right kind of challenge as students get to certain levels of maturity. So I'm going to try to make that idea as concrete as possible, but that requires me to go over a very simple problem so that I have a context. And for that, I'm going to use probably the most fundamental and arguably, this could get contentious, the most important problem in computer science, which is sorting. So I'm looking behind me, basically, there's a very simple representation of the memory of a computer. And I will do everything without using any of the technical lingo because there's no reason. The ideas are simple and elegant. Um, and what the computer typically does is it refers to each box with a number and this number never changes so I'm going to refer to it as a location so if I say what is location 3 the answer is that what's location 5 the answer is that and for us to use this for an actual purpose in this case sorting we have to populate these boxes with data so these cards represent somewhat randomly chosen numbers so the first box contains a 6 next one is 3 Next one is 1, 7, 5, 4, and 2. Now how does the computer sort them? There's a long list of ways of doing this. <clears throat> we start with a very simple one in our elementary class. And it's basically something that goes, they keep your hands at a fixed distance. In fact, they have to be separated just so that you are looking at a consecutive pair of boxes. And every time you look at a pair of boxes like that, if the numbers are not in the order that you want, you swap them and you move over to the next pair of boxes. So I look at 6 and 3, and they're not in the order that I want because ultimately I would like to have the numbers be sorted in ascending order. So I swap these two, and it becomes <clears throat> 3 and 6, and remember my hands were pointing to adjacent boxes like this. So once I'm happy with the local change I've made, I move over to the next set of boxes. And now I'm seeing 6 and 1. And once again, this is not in the order that I want. So I swap them. Oops. I move over to the next pair of boxes. 6 and 7, that's fine. I don't have to do anything. So I move over. 7 and 5, that's backwards. Move over. 7 and 4, backwards. And finally, 7 and 2 backwards and I swap them. And at this point, I have made progress. I have made these numbers get closer to being sorted, but I'm not quite there yet because lots of numbers are still not in the order that we wish. Um, but what we have noticed is that certain numbers like 7 was able to move over to where it was supposed to be, but some other numbers like 2 has a long way to go. So you can talk about how long, how efficient this solution is, this method is, by saying something along the lines of um, it took me, if there are x numbers in this memory, it took me roughly x steps to go from the beginning to the end. Yes, I was looking at pairs of them, but I was moving the pair up by only one position. So if there are x numbers to be looked at, I was looking at them roughly with x steps. One, two, three, four, and so on. And in the worst case, this number, which was sitting over here, has to go all the way to the other side. And if each one sweep, if each sweep that took x steps makes this number get closer to its destination by one position, and that distance in the worst case could be x, 
the overall number of steps to have this thing be sorted is going to be x times x steps. Um, the math is not terribly important. It's just basically a way for us to understand how we can talk about assessing the quality of the solution provided by this logic. So um, later on in a different class, we look at a survey of, we basically do a survey of sorting methods. And as we are trying to understand how efficient they are, we realize that almost regardless of the number of methods you see, they fall within one or two, one of two levels of goodness. So one set is always roughly performing at this level, another set does substantially better. So the bottleneck there is students will be able to write computer programs for the computer to follow the logic of any sorting method, but most of them will not realize why it is that regardless of which one they are implementing, it's bound to fall in one of two levels of goodness. So collectively we, we make this a question, and this is when that lens matter comes up, um, of all the kinds of problems that we can talk about sorting, that one is a particularly good candidate for being a bottleneck because all the students have a problem with it. Even when they can explain how a method works to a computer so that the computer can follow that logic, the students still have not been able to understand why it is that we have these two distinct levels of performance. Um, so one, basically, you can understand actually, I can just show you a little bit uh, here. The problem all had to do with me keeping my hands at a fixed distance. And I can have different kinds of logic to figure out where these two hands should point as I'm looking at the next pair of numbers to respond. But if I actually liberate myself and break this connection so that these two hands can be arbitrarily apart, I can take steps towards making the list be sorted that are much larger than the steps that I used to be able to make. And here's one good example. Instead of looking at pairs of numbers to respond, if I look at two and six, I realize that they're out of order and I bring the 2 over here and the 6 over here and not only those two numbers are in the proper order but they're also in proper places with respect to the two numbers that they moved around. This becomes that gateway to moving on to a more efficient set of sorting numbers. So the realization of this is going to be, unless a student is particularly gifted in computer science, the realization, this realization is going to be a bottleneck for them. Um, so now, what about threshold? There is one class where I go in at 9 o'clock in the morning and I prove to students that yes, there are two levels of goodness and in fact, I can mathematically show them that there's no way anyone can sort X numbers in exactly X steps. It always has to be more than X. So 9.50 my class is over, they go over to another class taught by my colleague and there they see a method that, does the pro that solves the problem in precisely X steps. And I can illustrate that to you. So instead of putting the numbers in there initially, I just have them in my hand. And I'm going to look at these numbers, and as they come out, number three just came out, I'm going to put it here. That's one step. Number one came out. That's the second step. Number five. That's the third step. Number two. That's the fourth step. Number four. That's the fifth step, number six. That's the sixth step, and number seven, and that's the, that's the seventh step. And it doesn't depend on the order in which the numbers came out of my head. Any permutation of those numbers would have led to this, because I'm looking at the number and using it as the location and then dropping the number in that box. So the reason why we consider this to be more of a threshold concept is because of all the, of all the methods that they have seen, while they are focusing on how they can go sweep this thing from left to right or keep their hands either this far apart or open that distance and exploring all the possibilities that come up from these options, at some point we realize that we can change the game and say momentarily you could take what used to be your data and treat it as location information. And that allows you to do something much more directly. And so there's a dual nature now to these numbers sort of like uh, light has dual properties, particle as well as wavelength. So we have numbers that are initially taken to be data, but momentarily we use them as location information, and in doing so, we go under a limit of goodness that was mathematically shown to be the case. So, um, and in fact, we actually set the stage so that students see my proof, 
are convinced that I was correct, go to my colleague's class, and he kind of messes up my results. And as students are trying to negotiate these two things, they are coming to terms with a wider understanding of what these things are, basically numbers, but they can be value as well as location information. So um, when we reflect on our own education, we realize that some of our best learning moments had to do with tackling problems. So yes, we read great books, yes, we had great instructors, and that, that's undisputable, but some of the greatest moments of learning happened as we conquered problems. So we are always trying to put the right set of problems in the curriculum so that our students can go through the same experience and own their learning as opposed to us passing them knowledge. Um, and so how do we pick from an endless list of problems the right ones so that the curriculum gets stronger, that the frustration is minimized but the intellectual challenge is maximized so much that by the time students are done with them they have made a significant step towards becoming a computer scientist. So that's when the lenses of throb uh, bottlenecks and threshold concepts have been very useful for us because there are lots of other problems that I could create here around this theme of sorting and most of them end up becoming syntactic details or maybe some of inconsequential in the big picture little nuances. But the two things that I showed you are pretty substantial and within them there's one that we think ends up having a rather transformative effect on the students and another one that has an effect on the entire class where we anticipate the barrier, we approach it, we spend time on it, we observe the students solve it, sometimes us nudging them in the right direction, but then we move forward. And so as opposed to when people hear about bottoms like next and threshold concepts, there's an implied obstacle there. But we're not actually approaching it like that. We're actually using them as filters to pick the right problems to, to enhance the curriculum. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. As I said, I've been very lucky to actually to be exposed to these ideas by my colleagues who are not computer scientists, which I think is really great. Um, talk about multidisciplinarity. And I, I know that you're going to enjoy the rest of the panel. Once again, I wish I were with you, but I couldn't make it. Um, and so, best of luck. Best of luck was the wrong phrase. I never know how to end up these uh, video presentations. But I hope you enjoy Australia, and that should not be too hard. Take care.